As the war between humanity and the Prakiki T reached its peak, Admiral Jana Bauer, known as the Angel of New Amsterdam, led the UNS forces in pushing the alien invaders out of UNS space. The naval battle of Paya system on July 23, 2276 was another turning point in the war, as Admiral Bauer defeated the Prakiki Ti's top admiral, Pluck. With the defeat of the main Prakiki T fleet at the hands of the UNS Navy, the road to the aliens' home world lay open. But the battle was not over yet. In the Suhiri star system, the Prakiki T had constructed a heavily fortified star base, a stronghold that had to be taken before the UNS could strike at the heart of the enemy's power. Captain Bambanani Adayemi, the commanding officer of the UNS Samiramis, led the charge. He and his crew fought with distinction, braving enemy fire and outsmarting the Prakiki Ti's defenses. The UNS forces were able to dismantle the star base and capture the Suhiri system, a major victory for humanity. The Admiralty on Sanctuary recognized Captain Adayemi's bravery and leadership skills and decided to promote him to the rank of full admiral. On January 25, 2279, the skies of the Prakikiti homeworld of Gish were lit up by the largest orbital landing in human history. General Esteban Rosario, the leader of the UNS Expeditionary Military Force, led the invasion of Gish, along with a contingent of elite Lazarus Dread Commando soldiers. The battle for Gish was one of the most brutal and bloody conflicts of the war. As the UNS Army and Air Force fought on the planet, the Dread Commandos infiltrated the Prakiki Ti strongholds, taking the aliens by surprise. The battle was intense, with both sides suffering heavy casualties. But by March 23, 2279, the Prakiki Ti homeworld had fallen into the hands of the UNS forces. With Gish and its surrounding planets, Nish, under their control, the UNS Navy set their sights on a new objective, capturing the ruined megastructures deep inside Prakiki T space. These structures held a high strategic value for the UNS government, and their capture was crucial for securing humanity's victory in the war. As the year 2280 progressed, tensions on the UNS world of Asiatica reached a boiling point. The long-term food and consumer goods shortages, coupled with the ongoing war, had left the citizens of Asiatica feeling abandoned and resentful. They began to openly call for independence, and their cries for freedom could no longer be ignored. Fearing that the colony would slip out of their grasp, the UNS government made the decision to declare martial law and mobilize the local UNS army to quell the unrest. Mass arrests followed and a widespread crackdown on dissenters was put into place. For a month, the UNS Army brutally suppressed any signs of rebellion, leaving the citizens of Asiatica cowed and defeated. But even as the unrest on Asiatica was being put down, turmoil was brewing within UNS space. The UNS government was struggling to deal with local revolts and an increase in piracy activities. It was becoming clear that the war with the Prakiki T could not be sustained and the government reluctantly agreed to a ceasefire and a truce. On August 11, 2280, the UNS government was facing a severe crisis. Food shortages and a lack of consumer goods were causing widespread suffering among the population. Desperate for a solution, the government came up with a controversial plan to use the Prakiki T population of the occupied world of Gish as migrant workers on the newly established UNS agriculture world of New Canada. This was a replacement for the doomed agricultural world of New Africa. The UNS government was careful to use the term migrant workers with unlimited contract renewals to avoid suspicion of the public, since slavery and forced relocation were banned across UNS space. However, unofficially, most UNS government officials referred to the move as prisoners with jobs programs. Despite the dubiousness of such a government move, the contracts were structured in such a way that it was intended to be a non-issue. The UNS government had essentially solved the shortages using slave labor from the Prakiki T populace. Soon after the great forced mass migration of Prakiki T, the UNS established the Commonwealth of Prakiki T, a puppet state to the two UNS occupied worlds of Gish and Nish. The UNS government designated the newly formed state as a prospectorium category, further stripping the Prakiki T of their autonomy and rights. The forced relocation and exploitation of the Prakiki T population sparked outrage and condemnation from the international community. But the UNS government remained stubborn in their stance, insisting that the move was necessary to address the food shortages and economic crisis. 
As the Prakikiti were forced to toil in the fields of New Canada, many began to question the true cost of the UNS government's actions. Two years after the forced migration of the Prakikiti to the agricultural world of New Canada, tensions had come to a head. On April 28, 2282, a revolt broke out among the Prakikiti migrant workers. The UNS government, determined to maintain control of the valuable agricultural world, responded quickly with the declaration of martial law. But the measures taken by the government failed to quell the unrest among the Prakikiti. The dissenters became more radicalized and bombings incidents by the Prakikiti became more frequent on the UNS world of New Canada. Even local human war veterans, sympathetic to the plight of the Prakikiti, joined in the workers' revolts, further complicating the problem. Fearing that the agricultural world would be lost to the Prakikiti workers' revolt, the UNS government took drastic action. They dispatched the war hero and veteran General Esteban Rosario, along with a contingent of the UNS army, to quell the revolt. The general, known for his ruthless tactics and iron-fisted rule, tried to establish order on New Canada. He put down the revolt with brutal force, leaving many Prakikiti dead or arrested. But his heavy-handed response only served to fuel the fire of dissent. The Prakikiti, who had been treated as nothing more than slaves, were determined to fight for their freedom. The situation on New Canada became increasingly volatile, with tensions rising between the UNS government and the Prakikiti workers. General Rosario, determined to maintain control, continued to crack down on any signs of rebellion. But the Prakikiti, pushed to the brink, refused to back down. The stage was set for a violent and bloody struggle. Elsewhere in UNS space, on April 9, 2283, the UNS government faced a critical problem. Logistical issues within their military were hindering their ability to effectively fight their enemies. In an effort to solve this problem, Admiral Bambanani Adeyemi presented an idea to the government to establish a private military company, PMC, called Fortress Initiative to be established in the Ikmail Star System. When Fortress Initiative opened its doors for business, it found its first client to be the horde of the Great Khan. An envoy was sent to sign the contract, much to the dismay of UNS government officials. Despite their disgust at the thought of working with a potential enemy, the UNS intelligence agency ISS saw an opportunity in the business offer. The ISS believed they could insert sleeper agents within the PMC for use in clandestine operations against the Great Khan. Despite protests from various government officials, the UNS government as a whole approved the contract, citing that the procurement of the Great Khan on UNS PMCs was simply business. Unknown to the envoy and the Great Khan, ISS sleeper agents were inserted into the fortress mercenaries. As the PMC began its operations, the UNS government watched with a mix of disgust and hope. They knew that they were working with their enemy, but they also knew that the ISS had a plan in place to use the PMC for their own gain. The stage was set for a dangerous game of espionage and subterfuge, as the UNS government and the ISS worked to outsmart the Great Khan and his horde. On August 2286, after years of instability and rebellion, the Prakiki Tea Workers' Revolt in the agricultural world of New Canada had finally been crushed. The UNS government, under the leadership of General Esteban Rosario, had used brutal force to quell the uprising, but with the revolt now over, the government was faced with a new problem, what to do with the remaining Prakiki Tea dissenters. They decided to send them to the UNS Center of Prevention, Integration and Citizenship Facility, where they would be fully integrated into UNS society, to be reshaped as new citizens of UNS. On October 25, 2290, the armistice signed between the UNS government and the Prakikiti fanatic purifiers expired. The UNS had no intention of renewing or extending the treaty, and overnight, hostilities between the two sides resumed. The UNS Navy quickly crossed the Prakiki T border, capturing the ruined Dyson Sphere located in the Uzan Star System and several other nearby systems. As the UNS government launched a renewed offensive against the Prakiki T, they received transmissions from their ISS agents on a clandestine mission to destabilize the Ballard Horde. To their surprise, they learned that the great Khan T had been poisoned by one of his more ambitious warlords in an attempted coup. With their beloved leader gone, a vicious power struggle had erupted within the Ballard Horde, effectively eliminating the threat to the galaxy, at least for the foreseeable future and the covert ISS mission was accomplished. 
The human Prakiki tea purification war finally ended on March 2293 with a UNS victory. The UNS military captured all the strategic areas and ensuring that the Prakiki tea is removed as a threat. However, the victory came at a great cost, both in terms of lives lost and the damage done to their reputation in the galaxy. The UNS government knew that healing the wounds inflicted by the war would take a long time and a lot of effort. The UNS government knew that the victory was a Pyrrhic one, but for now, peace had been restored.